when we are born into this world, we are born as one that is innocent, free of any sin. We grow and reach that age of accountability in which we commit sin because we know to have a knowledge of right and wrong and know to choose the right and eschew evil. But we commit sin. We then need to be reconciled to God and that it comes through Christ. But that reconciliation from our standpoint, while God has extended that grace to us where we can be saved, we have to do what Christ taught in order to be saved. Through our faith, we are going to repent of our sins. We're going to make a confession of our faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. And then we're baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. In that act of baptism, we're baptized (coughs) we're baptized into Christ. Paul would teach in Romans 6, chapter verse 3 and uh, 3 through 6. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. We also should, be in, should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that the old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. And so as we, the beginning of that reading, we're baptized into Jesus Christ. Galatians, the third chapter, in verse 26, tells us, For ye are all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Literally, that's by the faith. It's talking about by the word of God. We become uh, a child of God. Verse 27, though, tells us how that comes about. It explains the way in which it is accomplished. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ, and thus baptized into Jesus Christ. When we are baptized into Christ, thus we become a new creature. Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And thus we become that new creature. That's why it is spoken of, as we mentioned this morning, as a new birth. Because we are becoming a new creature. Uh, The passage that we read in Galatians 3 and verse 26, we become a child of God. Well, that's becoming a new creature in Christ Jesus. As a new creature, though, having begun this new life, as Paul would put it in Romans 6 again, we are raised up out of that watery grave of baptism to walk in newness of life. This newness of life, thus, all things are become new. We have truly a new life. And in our lesson this afternoon and probably the next few Sunday afternoons, we want to look and notice some of the new things in this new life. And first, we would say that there are new relationships There's a new relationship to God the Father. The world looks on God as an all-powerful being who will judge the world. That's if they believe in God even. So many today don't even believe in God. But we go back to the very first verse of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. <clears throat> God is an all-powerful creator who is able to create everything that we see. This, the heaven, literally heavens, and the earth. 
So as we look at the heavens, as we look at this earth, God is the creator of it. And he should be recognized as such. In, in Acts, the 17th chapter, as, as Paul is speaking to the Athenians on Mars Hill, he says <coughs> that God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and the earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Acts 17 and verse 24. Here's the God that made the world. Now, these Athenians really didn't believe in God. Not the God of the Bible, at least. They believed in the idols and just about any idol and every idol. Uh, they had an altar to every idol that they could think of and that they knew of. But they did not know the one true God. Here's the one God who made the heaven the world, everything in it. He's Lord of heaven and the earth. Quite different than those idols that they had built a temple to and that they had worship. God is the all-powerful creator of this world. In St. Corinthians 5th chapter and verse 18, <clears throat> Paul would write that all and all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and given to us the ministry of reconciliation. All things are of God. There's the all-powerful creator, that everything is of him. The world today is going more and more atheistic all the time. Really, they, don't, they would not affirm atheism itself. They will affirm that, well, then nobody knows. But in reality, they deny the existence of God. God is. We can prove that. We have evidence for that. There's no reason for anyone other than their own desires and wishes, to deny the existence of God. And that's really what it is. They deny the existence of God because they do not want God in their life. Uh, when David wrote, the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God, some have stated that instead of being translated, there is no God, which is an atheistic standpoint, that really what it is dealing with is that the fool has said in his heart, no God for me. I don't want God. And that's really the idea that is being presented. I don't want God in my life. I don't want anything about God. It's not so much an atheist that I don't believe God exists. I just don't want him in my life. Well, all things are of God. We have the evidence available to us that God exists. The Hebrews writer in Hebrews 12 and verse 23 would state to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. That God is the judge of all. He is that one who's going to judge everyone. And that's why no God for me. I don't want anything about God. But they really don't want the judgment of God because they want to live as they want and they desire, and they don't want to involve, have God involved in their life. And they certainly don't want an accountability to God. In Romans 2nd chapter and verse 12, Paul though would say, in the, God, in the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. There's coming a day in which God is going to judge the world. Judge even the secrets of men. 
Paul again in speaking to these same Athenians in Acts the 17th chapter. While we read verse 24 that God that made the world and all things therein. In verse 31, after he tells them that God has commanded all men to repent, verse 30, Verse 31, he says, Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. That here is this God, he is going to judge the world. Now, the Athenians basically rejected him at this point in time as a whole. There were some who obeyed who continued to listen and obey and heed his word. But they didn't want that. And to think of a resurrection from the dead, that was foolishness to them. And so let's just ignore everything, but here's a God that's going to judge the world. That's the way in which many in the world will look at God and really not see and go beyond that view of God. But the Christian goes beyond that because there's a new relationship that the Christian has with God because we see God not only as that all-powerful creator of the world who's going to judge the world, but we also view him as a loving, caring, heavenly father. As... Jesus instructs the uh, disciples as to how to pray. He tells them after this manner, giving them an example prayer, not one that is to be repeated today, but an example prayer. What is it? After this manner pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He tells them and instructs them to have this new relationship with God who is a father. He is our father in heaven. He's not just that all-powerful being. And that's basically, even in the Old Testament, we discussed this one Wednesday night, how that they didn't have that relationship in a personal relationship in considering God as a father to them. And yet, here is Jesus teaching them, He is our Father. You pray our Father in heaven. And that also, by the way, does instruct us as to who our prayers are to be addressed to. Not to be addressed to Jesus. They're not to be addressed to the Holy Spirit or to Mary or anyone else. They're to be addressed to the Father. If you go a little bit further in that Sermon on the Mount, in the seventh chapter in verse 11, he again addresses this same idea of God being a father when he says, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask of him? Here you are, you have a relationship with an earthly father. He's going to give good things to his children. Well, you have a heavenly father who's not just an all-powerful being that's going to judge the world, but you have a heavenly father who cares for you and loves you, and he's going to, even as an earthly father, give good things to those who ask him. What a wonderful relationship that we can have with God the Father. In Romans, the eighth chapter, we come down to verse 15, and he says, For we have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received, uh, but ye received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The term Abba was Aramaic, and it meant father, but it was used in a way in which to show a personal, close, familiar relationship with someone. 
and thus here's our Heavenly Father. We have a close personal relationship with Him. We're not the spirit of slaves anymore, but we have the spirit of adoption whereby we are His sons. Remember in Galatians, the third chapter, you're all sons of God by the faith in Christ Jesus, by being baptized into Christ. You put on Christ. Well, we have that spirit of adoption whereby we become children of God. And now then, we have that, that spirit of adoption whereby we can cry, Abba, Father that personal relationship with that heavenly being who is a father to us. And as we go down a few verses to verse uh, 28, he tells us that we know all things work together for good to them, <coughs> to them that love God and to them who are called according to His purpose. Here is a loving heavenly father who is going to give good things to His children, to those who ask of Him. Now then, we have that spirit of adoption whereby we can cry, Abba, Father, and what's the result? We know that all things work together for good to that individual. Why? Because He has a loving Heavenly Father to whom He's praying to. And that we, as His children, can thus cast our cares our burdens upon Him. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, casting all your cares upon Him, for He careth for you. You see, here is a loving Heavenly Father who is not just an all-powerful being, not just someone who is going to judge the world, but here is someone who cares for you. He cares for me. And as a result, I can cast my cares and my burdens, the things that are troubling me in my life, the weaknesses that I have, the troubles that come my way, the trials that we all face, and I can take them and cast them at His feet because of that care that He has for us. We go uh, once we are baptized into Christ and become this new creature, we go from being an enemy of the Father to being His friend. In Romans 5th chapter and verse 10, he says, For if, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much... <coughs> much more, being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. We went from being enemies, enemy of God, because we're not His child, we're not one who has been saved, we have not been baptized into Christ to become His child, thus we're the enemy of God, and we've been changed to being the friend of God. One who is in that personal relationship with Him. And thus, James 4 and verse 4 would tell us, Ye adulterers and adulterers, know ye not that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be the friend of the world is the enemy of God. You have the two areas, the two classifications, if you will, either being the friend of the world or the friend of God. If you're the friend of the world, then you are the enemy of God. You're not the friend of God. You're at enmity with Him. But we can be the friend of God by obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Or as Jesus would put in in John the 15th chapter and verse 14, Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. <clears throat> We become His friends by obedience to His will. <coughs> this really is what reconciliation is all about. We have gone from being His enemy, we have been reconciled back to Him so that now then there is peace that we have with Him. We are at one with Him. We've been reconciled together brought back together in a union with Him. And the Great Commission and Matthew's account of it, we many times in our English especially don't see this as much, 
because we see that baptism in the name of the Father, the Son, and the, and the Spirit, or the Holy Ghost. And we see that in the name of, and we immediately in our minds, as we normally should, think by His authority. They were doing something by the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But here it's a different word. It should be translated into, as the American Standard translates it, into the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And it deals with we are coming into a relationship with deity. We now have that new relationship. Why? Because that baptism has reconciled us to him, and we now have that new relationship. It also is the meaning of Christ making peace. As we see in Ephesians, the second chapter, almost the entire chapter is dealing with this idea. But in verse 14, he says, For he is our peace who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Now the middle wall of partition that was between us, he's dealing with Jew and Gentile, and that middle wall of partition was the Old Testament law that was a barrier between the Jew and Gentile. And yes, Christ has broken down that wall that separated the Jew and Gentile, thus making peace between them. By the way, if you want peace with others, convert them to Christ. That's the way true peace will be attained. But now then, He is our peace. It's not only a peace that comes from with one another, but He's made both of us one in Christ. And there's now peace that we have with God because of that which Christ has done. We have that peace with the Father because of Christ. <clears throat> so we have a new relationship with God, but we also have a new relationship to Christ. As we talk about Christ in our society today, to many or at least to some, they deny that Jesus ever lived. In spite of all of the abundant evidence, even if you removed the Bible evidence from the, the evidence that is being able to be presented, you still have overwhelming evidence that a man named Jesus lived. And that he died, he was crucified, and that the tomb in which he was laid was empty. And I'm saying remove all the biblical evidence and you still have overwhelming evidence of those facts. Some have stated that, you know, there's no doubt that George Washington lived. And yet there's more historical evidence for the fact that Jesus of Nazareth lived than there was for George Washington. Now then, they're not going to tell you that, and they're going to hide that, but yet some deny his even existence. Most will not deny the existence of Christ, but when they look at him, all they see is, well, he was a good man. He was a good individual. He lived a good life. When well, reality, if he is not what he said he is and what he claimed to be, then in, he wasn't a good individual. He was an evil, wicked person if he is not God manifested in the flesh. but they view him simply as a good individual. He was moralistic. He gave us some good morals. Now, you can't live by all of them. They, would go, they wouldn't want to go that far. But that's the way in which they view him. 
John describes really to a certain extent the purpose of his book, but to a great extent the entirety of the New Testament. That many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. John's saying, I'm writing not only that you'll believe that Jesus was a good man, not only that you will believe that he existed, but I'm writing so that you will come to believe that he is the, the Christ, the Son of God. And through that belief, you can have life. Because he truly was, as Matthew 1 and verse 23 states, that behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And again, either he was God with us, or else he was a wicked individual. He was a liar, he was a charlatan. In fact, if he was not the Son of God, God with us, he perpetrated the greatest fraud upon humanity that's ever been devised. That's not a good individual. That's an evil individual. But he was God with us. Paul would write it in this way in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16, that without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preaching to the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Here's Jesus of Nazareth, God manifested in the flesh. But to the Christian, he's more than that. To that one who has been baptized into Christ, he has become their personal Savior. I realize denominational usage of that, and they misuse it, but there's no reason to, rec to fail to recognize He is a personal Savior. There is an aspect of personal saving that He does. Jesus would claim, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14 and verse 6. There is that aspect. I am, Jesus says, that way. There's no other way. If you as an individual want to go to the Father, you've got to come through me, Jesus says. That's a personal aspect of His being our Savior. Paul would say it in 1 Timothy 2 verses 5 and verse 6. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself for a ransom for all to be testified in due time. He is that mediator between God and me, man. And he gave himself a ransom for each and every individual. No wonder and that account of Jesus prior to his birth, being told by, uh, Mary being told by an angel, or Joseph being told by an angel, that he, she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's what Christ is. In Galatians, the second chapter, though, Paul takes it to a very personal level when he says in Galatians 2 and verse 20 that I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, <coughs> the faith of the Son of God who loved, he says, me and gave himself for me. There is a personal aspect. We could rightly say 
And Paul would have been true in saying that he, he loved the world and gave himself for the world. But Paul didn't do that here. He recognized that personal relationship that he had, that Jesus Christ is my Savior. That if I was the only person in the world, that that second person of the Godhead would have left heaven's home and come to this world and suffered the death on the cross in order to save me, no one else. That's a personal relationship that we have with our Savior. He's going to save me because He loves me. But that relationship that we have can only be found if we are in Christ Jesus. Paul he recognized Christ loves me, gave himself for me. But Paul had also recognized when Ananias came to him that while he believed in Jesus as being the Christ, the Son of God, that he still needed something to do something. And Ananias comes to him and then tells him, Why tarest thou rise and be baptized and wash away thy sin? Saul, at that time, still had his sins upon him. Even though he had said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He recognized there was something for him to do. And Jesus tells him, even though he's recognized him as Lord now, go into the city and there it shall be told thee what thou must do. Saul recognized that there's something I must do. Jesus recognized, Saul, there's something you must do. And you're going to be told what that is is that you must do when you go into Damascus and Ananias is going to be sent to you. And Ananias comes and tells him, you need to be baptized to have your sins washed away. Jesus died so that they could be. He loves you so that they could be. He gave himself for you, Saul, as an individual so that you could have them washed away. Now then you, upon your faith and your repentance, and your con- make that confession of your faith and be baptized for the remission of your sins, washing away your sins. And Jesus will thus save you. And there will be that personal relationship, Saul, that you have with Jesus of Nazareth. A relationship that you and I can have by doing exactly the same thing that Saul of Tarsus did. That through our faith, when we repent, when we make that confession, when we are baptized in water, we are baptized into Jesus Christ. We come into that relationship with Him. There's that personal relationship that I now, that you now have with God the Father, and yes, with Jesus the Son. If you've not obeyed that gospel this afternoon, we would encourage you to come and to make things right with God, to obey that gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you've fallen away, not lived in that way that God wants you to live, not continued in obedience to Him, then why not come back and to Him this afternoon? Repent of your sins and let us pray with you for the forgiveness of them. So if we can help you in this way, we would encourage you to come as we stand and sing the invitation song.